have come to chapter 19, we will be looking at 16 to 30. 16 to 30. Chap Matthew chapter 16, chapter 19, 16 to 30. And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deeds ma must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which one? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honour your father and mother, you, sh you shall love your neighbour as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what is you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, uh, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciple, Truly I say to you, only with difficulties will a rich man enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and follow you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on the glorious throne, you will have, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses and brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or land for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life for many who are first will be last and last will be first. This text is quite clear because it, it begins with a rich man's asking Jesus a question. Teacher, what good deeds must I do to have eternal life? So this passage is really about the rich man and salvation. Or it's about wealth and the gospel. It is quite, it is especially clear in verse 22, when the young man here heard of this, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. So we know that this, this man, this young man, is very rich because he had great possessions. And verse 23, Jesus said, Only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said it's difficult for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Yet today, many wealth and health Gospel preacher keep feeding the ego of men by telling them to get more money and more wealth in their life. If that is the case, do you think they are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ? Matthew 6 26, Matthew 6 24 say that no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and hate, despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through the crafting, craft, it is through the craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Against 1 Timothy 6 9 says, For those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless 
harmless desire that plunge people into the ruin and destruction. And the solution to all is this. First Timothy 6, 6 say this, but godliness with great, with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, we cannot take anything out of the world, but if we have food and clothing with this world, we will be content. So it's quite clear that this text is really talking about money and gospel, money, wealth and salvation. The outline today is very simple. It's quite clear from this text. In fact, if you look at this text, you will see that there are three conversations. Jesus' conversation with three parties. The first one is the young man. Because verse 16 says, A young man came to him asking, What good deeds must I do to have eternal life? So he's asking inquiry. He asked Jesus, what about salvation? Secondly, Jesus said to, in verse 23 to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulties will a rich person enter kingdom of heaven. How difficult? Jesus said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eyes of the needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they say, who can be saved? How, why ask this such question? Because they realize what Jesus, the way of Jesus' question, question is, it's impossible. That's why in verse 26, Jesus looked at them and said, we men, this is impossible. That's why I entitled the second point, the impossibility of salvation. For a rich man to be saved, it is impossible. We will look into that later. And the third point is verse 27. Then three, group of, three groups of people, the young men, three parties, the young men, the disciples, and now Jesus is talking to Peter. In verse 27, then he said to Peter, in reply, say, Jesus answered Peter, uh, sorry, Peter answered Jesus saying, we have left everything and follow you. What then will we have? So this is the incentive of salvation incentive of salvation so that is our online the inquiry the impossibility and the incentive of salvation is money important of course money is not everything i know but without money you are nothing but however most of us money is not the problem the problem is no money <laughs> well, money and wealth are not the problem. It is the greed of the heart that is the problem. That's why just now I show you this text, 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money, we're talking about the love of money, is the root of all kind of evil. In fact, I want to highlight at the beginning that this is the only time that Jesus asked anybody to sell everything and give everything away. There are many rich people in the Bible. In the Old Testament, we have the Abraham, who is very rich. We have Job, who is very rich. We have Solomon, who is the richest person in the world. In the New Testament, we have Nicodemus. And then, of course, Joseph the Arimathea, whose tomb was used by Jesus for burial. And then, of course, Zacchaeus, who willingly gave his money, portion of his money, not all, to, 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 the, to, the, to the people. So Jesus never asked us to sell everything. But he's talking about the heart. Are you willing? What is more important in your heart? So why Jesus asked this young man to sell everything to follow him? It is because Jesus knew his problem. He knew his issue. The issue is the issue of the heart. Yeah, the young man's problem is his heart. His heart is greedy. That's why Jesus asked the question is to reveal his condition of his heart. The proof is very simple. Just now I mentioned this. Verse 22 says, This young man heard all these things and went away sorrowful because he has a lot of possessions. He is very rich. And he prefers money more than heaven. He rather keep his money rather than a blessing from heaven. 
He said, what can I do to earn eternal life? Jesus said, sell everything. He said, no, I will keep everything. I'd rather forego eternal life. So that proved this is what happened, what is really going on in the man, the young man's heart. The question Jesus asked revealed his heart condition. And in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, say, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? You can be rich. In fact, I'm always amazed. Last time I have trouble because when we talk about the richest man, we'll talk about Bill Gates. And you look at his family, so nice, you know. But today his family is broken. He's divorced again. Then you look at all the rich person. You look at Amazon's chief. You look at all the greatest richest person in the world look at the family look at the life condition they gain the whole world and lose their life what is the point so what you are talking about people the love of money the love of money bring pains because again i call you the same verse that i i quoted you before first timothy 6 10 say for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil it is through the craving of something that one wander away from so that he will wander away from faith and pierce himself with many pangs so when you have a lot of trouble when you have a lot of depression when you have a lot of something really trouble you nine out of ten is because of money and how do we get into heaven a lot of times we think we, the more money we have, the easier we get to. Then by the, the Lord said in this text, the more you have, the more, more difficult you have. In fact, if, if almost impossible, or rather we'll say it is impossible for you to get into heaven because you have so much. For rich people to get into heaven, it's just like going through a turn tape. Do, have, you seen, have you seen a revolving door? If you go traveling, you'll see that a lot of Western countries, yeah, they have all these revolving doors. And then if, long time ago, I heard the story that this, uh, the, there's a farmer try, from the village and came into the, came into the city and entered in this hotel and with huge luggages and then trying to get into this revolving door. The more he, they try to get in, they cannot get in. Heaven is just like going through the revolving door. If you bring all the things that with you, you think you want to get, get in, you bring nothing here, you bring nothing out. You cannot bring anything into heaven from the earth. So the more you have, the more possession you have, the more difficult for you to get through. And I have, in fact, I have told you this story before and I, I want to repeat it again. Do you know old times how people catch monkey? Basically, they have a jar. And the jar is, the opening is so big enough for the monkey's hand to go in through the jar so that they can grab the food or anything that they want. <clears throat> so, but once they hold their fist, the, 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 the hole, they cannot get out of the jar with the hand. So, how do you rescue the monkey? It's very simple. You, what you need to do is just let go. Only you let go, your hand can come out. So of course you see that <clears throat> this is how, in fact, you, this is very common. Today, we want to get into heaven, but our hand is full of, we just grab hold the world, the possession. We hold, the more we hold tightly, the more we cannot get, let go. The more we cannot let go, the more, the more hard, the harder that we can, we cannot, the harder we can get out of this. So today we hold on to the things that we have. That's why we cannot be safe. That's why we cannot let go. That's why we are have so much trouble. And there are many Christians today, after becoming a Christian, still holding on to the world's possession. Still holding on things that belong to this world. Not willing to let go. That's why they have so much trouble in their heart. If you only we are willing to let down and trust God, only when you are become vulnerable, when you are willing to be dependent on God, then you can have peace. But today, we want to do things our way, we want to get things what we want, 
The more things we hold on to, the more desire you have, the more trouble that you have. So let us dive into this text and see what, what the Lord say. In, so the first point is the inquiry of salvation. Verse 16 says that, Behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deeds must I do to have eternal life? In our text, he said, a man. In fact, in all synoptic gospel, talk about all this story. Matthew called, there's a young man. And in Luke said, this is a certain ruler. So young man, in the Hebrew words, it, in the Hebrew culture is roughly 20 to 40 years old. And this young man likely to be a religious lay leader. Very possibility he is a Pharisee. And then he came to Jesus, publicly called Jesus teacher. The word is rabbi, meaning address him respecting, respectfully. So his question is probably a very sincere one. He asked Jesus, what can I do? In fact, in the, Mark, in the book of Mark, say, he ran, he ran, he ran, he ran up to Jesus and knelt before Jesus and asked. Can you imagine you, a little bit culture? Hebrew respected men, especially rich men, never run in public. They always walk with air. So not only that, this young man came running and knelt before Jesus. So this is probably very sincere and said, no, I know my needs. I have a desire in heart, my heart. I, my heart has a whole, I know I need eternal life, but I don't have. Although I'm a religious man, because later on you see that he, he fulfilled, he tried to keep all the laws, but, he, but inside him, you know he's not happy, he's not contented, he's not satisfied. There's an emptiness in his heart, so he come to Jesus and say, what can I do to have eternal life? So Jesus asked him this question, why do you call me good? In verse 17, he said, why do you call me good? There's only one who is good. There's only one who is good. Meaning, all no good people. We always ask, why bad things happen to good people? The answer is, there's no good people. Only God is good. There's no none good. In Mark, the same record in Mark, in Mark's record, chapter 10 said, Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. If your theology is correct, all men are sinners. There's no good men. Romans 3, 10 said, None is righteous, no, not one. Not one understand, no one seeks God. Romans 3, 10, 18 said, There is no fear of God before their eyes. Everybody do their things the way they want it. Nobody fear God. What is good? Many people think that I'm a good person. That is according to your own standard. But before God, he said nobody is good in, before God's eyes. You don't, your judgment, your, some people did tell me before that, his conscience is clear. I said your conscience is not your judgment, your concern is corrupted. Your final judge is God Himself. You have to go by God's standard. And what did God want? God said, you must be perfect like I am perfect. That's the only standard that God will accept. And with that standard, we know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Because God created us perfect and He wants us to be perfect and we don't behave such a way that we fall short of the glory of God. So he came, he asked the Lord, what can I do? Notice what he's asking. He wants to do something. When we ask for the question about salvation, we always say, uh, can I do something to get into heaven? This world actually falls into two religions. One is work religion, meaning you have to do something to get into heaven. The other one is by grace, by faith. It's only a gift from God. Coming to be saved is not what you can do, only what you can believe. Only if you trust God and you 
put yourself totally depend on God, you cannot be saved. But this young man's quite problem is that he trusts himself. He said, what else can I do? What else can I do? He wants to, through his own effort, through his own way, he wants to get into heaven. And notice what, what the Lord Jesus answered him. But before that, let, this text reminds me in John 6. John 6, 28 said that just, there's someone asked Jesus, what must we do to be doing the work of God? And Jesus answered, this is the work of God that you believe in Him whom He has sent. In order to get into heaven, you need to believe Him. You have need to, the word believe is not just intellectual belief. The, be, the word believe is to trust Him. To, to rely on Him. The word is rely is a better word. You, you through Him that you get into heaven, not through your own self that you get into heaven. Because none of us can work our way to heaven. That's why Romans 3.20 say this, for by works the law by the works of the law no human being will be justified by his sight since to the law comes the knowledge of sin meaning nobody can do anything to get into heaven you need to trust you need to rely on Jesus rather than rely on yourself what is interesting to me is this text when he asked Jesus what can i do to get into heaven of course, we, answer, we know the answer is by faith, not by works. But this, the way, how did Jesus answer him? The, the way Jesus answered him also surprised us. Because in verse 17, the second half, he said, If you would enter life, keep the commandments. Jesus never thought of faith. Jesus said, keep commandments. Jesus said, obey the law. Then Jesus go ahead and say that, and this, this young man said, which one? And Jesus said, in verse 18, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Of course, if you are familiar with Ten Commandments, you are familiar with the Bible, you know this is Ten Commandments. Jesus is quoting Ten Commandments. So I want to tell you that if you want to share the gospel, you want to share the good news, gospel is good news. You want to share the good news, please share the bad news first. What is the bad news? Bad news is you must keep the law. You want, if you want to work your way to, to God, you must keep God's law. So how do I know I'm a sinner? Look, I cannot prove that you are a sinner, but if you tell them you keep God's law, if you try to keep God's law, you will know that you cannot keep God's law. Anyone sincerely try to keep God's law, you will know that it's impossible to keep God's law. And notice that, interesting that, Jesus quote, only half of the Ten Commandments. In fact, it's the second half of the Ten, ten, ten Commandments. Do you realize that Jesus quote only half of the Ten Commandments? It's basically it's from the sex to the ninth commandment. One of the the sex and the ninth commandment is talking about the ethical or talking about how to relate to one another. What about the first part of ten commandment? The first part of ten commandment is talking about relationship with God. So Jesus never talked about relationship with God. In fact, he did. He did. He said in verse 21, if you were to be perfect, the word perfect meaning if you want to be complete. If you say, I already keep it all, okay, all means all. So you want to be complete, you want to completely follow. Then he said, go sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Of course, when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possession. So Jesus' question, Jesus' answer is this. 
Why Jesus asks you to go and sell everything and give it to the poor and have treasure in heaven and come and come and uh, come and follow me? Because why did Jesus want to tell him to sell everything? Because Jesus knew his heart. His heart. The important thing about him is not keeping the commandment. The second half. The commandment is the first half. The first half is you must honor the Lord and you must love your God with all your heart and all your soul. So you love your money more than heart. That's why Jesus asked this question so that your heart will be revealed. So this young man, he loved his money more than everything else. Of course, I understand this. It, and it is, we all work. And we work for what? We work for money. Make no mistake. Today, of course, a lot of people work for their interests and work for many other reasons. But the key, if there's no money, we work. Ultimately, it's about money. And it's not wrong to work for money because the Bible says that you must earn a living so that you can feed yourself. You don't rely on others to feed you. And not only that, you earn money so that you can help others. But today, we, want, we earn money so that we can make ourselves proud. Work becomes uh, our identity. We make ourselves somebody. And you work so hard because you want to be somebody. And you basically, is you prop yourself up. But if you have enough money, what do you do? You want more money. There you are. Jesus proven that you, your heart is driven. Your heart is dominated. Your heart is full of money. But if you have enough, you know, if I have enough, what should I do? I should serve the Lord. I should be sharing the gospel. I should be glorifying God. I should be worshipping God. I should be helping others. But today, when we work, it's, it's not wrong. I, mu I must repeat again, it's not wrong. In fact, it should. We should earn our money to feed ourselves and feed our family and also to help others. But what shocked me in this, this young man, he said, when Jesus said, keep this commandment, he said, which one? Jesus lists down all this second half of the commandment. He said, I kept them all. What do I still lack? That is very shocking. Because in this text, nobody, nobody will be justified. Nobody will be justified by law. And then this, this man thought he just, he thought he keep it all. He said, look, you shall not murder. Jesus said that if you hate somebody, you already murder. You shall not commit adultery. You, your mind is thinking about other women than your wife, you already committed adultery. You are thinking about other's possession, you're already greedy. So this, this young man fully complied with, no, he didn't. And, but Jesus let him go. Jesus pressed more important issue is that not just you keep, didn't keep this fully, all this commandment, he go ahead and talk about your heart with God. You must honor God and God alone should deserve your full attention and your full love. But, what did he do? When Jesus asked this question, if really that is the case, let me ask you, sell everything. If you're willing to sell everything and serve God, that's it. Then you are truly safe. You are truly fulfilled the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments is to show what the character, what God expects. But of course, when the law is given, the law is given so that we know we cannot our sinful nature would not allow us to do all these things. It's impossible. So what the Lord wants us is full-heartedness to serve God. Think about it. If Jesus Christ died on the cross for you, what should you do for Him? You just give Him peanuts? You give Him a little bit of your time? Or give it a little bit of your years? No, you have to serve Him with all your heart, your mind and soul. And there's nothing new here. You must sell everything. You, you, sometimes we think sell everything is so difficult. But don't you remember we just gone through this. What is discipleship? Discipleship is Matthew 16. He said you deny yourself. Jesus said if you want to be my disciple, if you want to come after me, deny yourself, take up the cross and follow me. We've gone through this text. What does deny yourself mean? Meaning you say this guy never existed. 
I don't care about this guy. He said no to this guy. He said no longer me. And take up the cross. Are you take up a cross is that you're willing to die for Christ? Because the word cross in all those days meant for death sentence. If you take up a cross, mean Jesus take up a cross, he's going to be nailed and going, going to die. He said, unless you want to deny yourself, say no to yourself, unless you're willing to die for me, and then you can follow me. That requirement for discipleship in Jesus Christ is so high. But today we make it so simple and say, never mind, just I believe in the, in, the, in the salvation, I believe in the gospel, and then do whatever you want. You continue your life as if that you, the life belongs to you. But if somebody dies for you, you own the person your whole life. That is the same reason that Jesus said this, whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves daughter, son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves, whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for, this, for my sake will find it. So are you willing to lose your life in, on earth to gain your life in heaven? That is the question. Today we find our life here. You want to have a full life here and you lose your life in heaven. That is what he's talking about. If you take this text seriously, then you listen to the sermon, you listen to the preaching of all the people. Tell me how, how many of them are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you don't preach this, the bar is so high. If we are, we just say believe and you get to heaven and then you continue, you live your life as if that wherever you lie, life belongs to you and do whatever you want. That is not what the gospel, what the Bible say. They never really read the Bible. They just listen to what other people say. But if you look at this Bible and then you follow seriously, you know the weightiness of our teaching. This is what the Bible say. Matthew 22, 37 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your souls, and with all your mind. Of course, we know this is very hard. It's very difficult for us to give up. I would say, not only difficult, it's impossible. I don't know whether you, what you think. I think it's quite impossible for us to do this. But Jim Elliot said something that challenged our thinking. Do you know who is Jim Elliot? Jim Elliot is an American, um, American um, missionary went to South America and shared gospel with Alka Indians. We're talking about American Indians. And of course, he, he lost his life there. He was killed. And he said this. Why do he want to give up his life? He, he has a very good American life. Why do he want to give it up and go to a South American jungle, into the jungle and be killed by the Indian? He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Whatever you try to do on hold, why try to get hold on in this life, you will lose it. But you will gain eternal life is something that you cannot lose it. In fact, this text, if you look into this text carefully, it says two things. In fact, there are two commands here. The first command is go, give up everything. Go sell everything and give it to the poor. Go and give up everything. The second command is come and follow me. There are only two commands. Of course, there are set of four. Basically, they are in the category or two category. Say, go on and sell everything. Go and give up everything. If you hold on to this world and things of this world, you don't have Jesus Christ in your heart. And this is what the Lord wants us. 
He said, you sell everything, give out everything. We're talking about the heart, the desire of the heart. And then come and follow Jesus. And go and come are two commands. They are, they are imperatives. So he said, you must do this. Of course, there are many Christians here. I'm preaching to the choir. Oh, I'm a become a Christian already, but the question is, do you still hold on to the world? Or are you, have you always let the Lord rule in your heart, let the Lord be the king or the master of your heart, or you still want your own way? That is something that we, we have to deal with it ourselves. So that's what Jesus told this young man, and what happened to this young man? This young man went away sorrowful. Why sorrowful? Because he knew. He didn't say, Jesus, you talk nonsense. No, he said, he went away sorrowful, I mean, he knew Jesus is right. He, he knew Jesus knew he, know his heart. And he cannot let go. And he went away. Of course, this is one of the heartbreaking verses in the Bible. So, when Jesus talked to the disciple, that's where our second point. The inquiry of salvation, our second point is the impossibility of salvation. Let's look in verse 23. Matthew chapter 19 verse 23 say and jesus said to his disciple truly i say to you only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom how difficult verse 24 i tell you it is easy it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than a rich person enter the kingdom of god verse 25 then the disciple heard this that is greatly astonished and say who then can be saved Jesus said, of course, with men it's impossible. With men it's impossible. So what he's saying, how difficult? It's impossible. Left to ourselves, it's impossible to, become, to, come, to come, come to Jesus. We, we, are, we are, in those days, in the olden days, we believe that, assuming this is the needle, needle, there's a, there's an eye of the needle. If you have a rope, you don't even, you can go through. Don't let alone a camel. Camel is the biggest animal in the Middle East. Of course, we have lions. They don't have lions. They have camel. A camel go through the eyes of the needle. What he's saying is not possible. Of course, we were taught long ago, long, uh, in Jerusalem, there is one gate called the needle eye. Actually, they, you know, they go ahead and find archaeologists, try to dig, and they cannot find such a gate. So, what is, they are twisting this text. This text is saying, it's impossible. And, and the following text, I say, that's why it prompted this uh, disciple's answer in verse 21. Who can be saved? The answer is, no one. So, this is basically, basically, who can be saved? He said, rich person cannot go through. Can rich person get through? Rich person cannot be saved. Not only a rich person, we also cannot be saved. That's why Jesus, yes, it, it, it becomes very sad, hopeless. Nobody can be saved. But this, the Lord said, with man it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Salvation is of the Lord. The only come from the Lord. Salvation is not through our own doing. Salvation only through the Lord. That's why I call this impossibility. Impossibility. Impossible to get salvation. Ephesians 2, chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 say this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God not a result of work so that no one can boast no one can boast means it's not up not your own doing he says salvation it is a gift of god not a result of work it's not what you do it is directly from god and how can a rich man be saved look he has to come from god if you remember the lady called lydia in the book of acts how did Lydia come to know, come to accept Jesus as Savior? In fact, the book of Acts chapter 16 says this, The Lord opened her heart and paid attention to what Paul, what said by Paul. 
It's the Lord who opened the hearts. He said, no, I want to serve God. I want to come to know God. If you had such desire, it is because God already working in your heart and prompt you to open, to see, so that you can listen, so that you can understand. So it is God's at work. In fact, uh, 1 Timothy chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 24 say, this is talking about, this verse is talking about what uh, uh, God, the Lord's servant must do. He said, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach patiently, endure evil, correcting the opponent with gentleness. Then he said, God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. I thought repentance is a, my own doing. No, it's actually God from you, get you to repent. Even repentance is from God. Even repentance is from God. With man it's impossible, but with God it's possible. In fact, there's one verse in John 6, 44, which I always quote, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Unless God the Father draws him, nobody can come to Jesus Christ. So all salvation come from the Lord. So I want to say to the mothers, but no, not, not just the mothers, all the parents, and also all the people sitting here, if you have unbelieving, if you have unbelieving family members or friends that you want to bring to, to, to Jesus Christ, I would say this, you need to pray. That's why prayer meeting is very important. That I want to call the people come to prayer meeting. Come to prayer meeting because through us we can do nothing. Without God's help, we are only doing all the action. The action bring nothing, no fruit. It is through prayer that the Lord work that brings result. So let's pray, 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 especially we have many children here. Please pray, please come together. All the mothers have special prayer meeting every week, every month. Or maybe we even have another group of pray for all unbelieving family members. All come. We pray and pray and pray. Only salvation is come from the Lord. It's impossible with men. Because God's bar is so high. He wants us to sell everything. He wants us to give up everything. No man, no natural man can do this thing. But only God can put this in the heart. Sometimes I wonder, when I talk to Christian, I don't talk to some of the brothers and sisters sitting here, I see how fervent you love the Bible, you memorize the Bible, you quote from different parts of the Bible, that means you have been reading so hard. And I look at this, you know how hard to read this Bible? This Bible is 2,000, no, 5,000 years old if you come from Moses. Such an old book and then you can memorize it. Nothing can make you do this unless God is working in your heart. That is sign of grace. It's sign of grace. How can a person give up everything to serve God? He give up a little bit, it's already hard enough, but I've seen people giving up something where they come from, it comes from God. That's why when we come to church and prayer meeting, what do we do? We praise God for all these signs of grace among us. Because God is at work in, in, in us. So we need to pray. So in this text, we see that the inquiry of the salvation, what must I do to earn salvation? The answer, you cannot do anything. You need to trust God. That's why the impossibility, you only trust that's why we need to come to God. Without God, without the Holy Spirit, we do all the things will be in vain. And the last point is the incentive of salvation. Let's look at verse 27. Verse 27 says, Then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and follow you. What then will we have? Hiya, this Peter almost sounded like he is uh, the same young, the young man, the same thing. What must I do? What must I have? Jesus, Peter said, Hey, I already follow you. What did I get? 
Verse 28 say, Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, in the new world, in fact this word, uh, in the renewal, some translations say, when the restoration, meaning when the Lord come again, when He restore this world, likely this will be in the millennium. Then He said that the Son of Man will sit on His glorious throne. The Son of Man, Jesus Christ, will be sitting on the glorious throne. You who have followed me will sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. He's talking about the twelve disciples. The twelve disciples, because you give up everything, when the second the come judgment, you will be sitting together with me, sitting on the twelve thrones and judging the Israel. We're talking about the twelve tribes, uh, the twelve disciples that follow Jesus. Then what about us? Okay, continue reading verse 29. And everyone, oh, everyone meaning including us now, everyone who left houses or brother or sister or father or children or land for my name's sake will receive hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. So what he is saying is this. Everyone meaning everyone who believe, everyone similar to uh, the 12 gods, the 12 apostles, that they, they believe in Jesus Christ, they left everything and follow him who highly Worship God, worship Jesus Christ, follow Him, acknowledge Him as God and let Him be your master and ruler and Lord of your life. If you do that, you will have hundredfold than what all these people have. And of course, this text didn't tell us. We know that Jesus Christ said that at the end, in millennium, we will reign with Him. He will let us sit together with Him as King. I don't know how it works. But it's a promise from God. It's like you have this promise. But are you sure that you left your house, your brother, your sister, your mother, your children, your land? Can you say that? If you do, yes. That is an incentive. But we come to the Lord. Yes, we believe in the Lord because He is the glorious Lord. He's the Creator. We need to worship Him. But besides that, He did promise us other blessing, spiritual blessing. Therefore, we can come. I'm going to conclude this text. Of course, this text talks about incentive of salvation, impossibility of salvation, and incentive of salvation. But why? Why did the Lord talk about this text here? Why talk about the rich young men? Why talk about rich young men? I thought we were just last last summer we talked about young, we talk about the the children, right? Let the children come to me. But why now talk when you talk about children, why talk about why talk about the rich men? When we talk about the children, in fact in in, in the he said, let the children come to me. In fact the children we in in chapter 18 verse 3 say truly i say to you unless you turn and become like children you will never enter the kingdom of heaven again we are talking about kingdom of heaven he said unless you turn and become like children you will never enter the, the kingdom of heaven whoever humble himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven so what does this mean remember we talk about this he said you must return we must turn to become like children. Just like Nicodemus, how can I be born again? How can I go back into the, the, the mother's womb and then get born again? The answer is this. You know, in those days, children are not like today. To, today, children are so privileged. You, you, hold, you, know, you, you give all the best to the children. In those days, our farming society, agriculture society, children are no value. Children have no power. Children have no right. In fact, they sell the children for slavery. He said, children have no right. Children is vulnerable. Children easily get hurt. He said that unless you become like children, you humble yourself, you lower yourself, you become like children, become, I'm not depending on self because child, children is defenseless. They cannot fight for themselves. He said, you, unless you become like children, you trust God and what He has do is totally trust God in His arm and let Him do for you rather than you do for yourself, you cannot be saved. And then why talk about rich young men? Because this rich young man basically is the opposite of the, the, the children. Because he has a lot. Children have nothing. 
But this is rich young man. He has a lot. He has great possession. He has a lot of power. He has a lot of money. He has a lot of resources. That's why he cannot be saved. And this go back to our original preaching on the Sermon of the Mount. Remember, Sermon of the Mount said this: "Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven." Again, what does "poor in spirit" means? The word "poor" I mentioned to you before. There are two words in the Greek describing poor. One is begging poor, meaning the guy is so poor that he cannot feed himself. Of course, there are another poor. It's like he is he's poor, but he's still working. But the the word used here is he is so poor that he cannot feed himself. He is so helpless, and he asks for God help me. That's why he can be saved. If you think you are relying on yourself to do it again. Through your own power, through your own strength, through your own design, through your own way, you cannot be saved. That's why he said, "Poor in the in, in the poor in the spirit, blessed are the poor in spirit, because the kingdom of heaven." And poor are those who mourn. How can be the word "blessed" is is the word "happy"? Happy are the the sad. How can it be? Again, I told you last week is oxymoron. This is incongruent. It's basically look. Happy. If you are sad over your sin, you should be happy because you will be saved. That's why he said, "Blessed are the meek. The meek are the sh- the gentle, the quiet, the easy, easily be be bullied. Those are people. I am telling you, these are the people know the weakness of men and they trust. They reach out and say, just like Peter said, "Lord, save me." Unless you reach that status to see your bankruptcy in your heart, you cannot be saved. So what this text tell us, I think he had to tell us: Were you willing to give up all to follow Christ? Of course, many of us are here are Christian, but you say, "Yeah, I want, I want to. I know I cannot do it. I need to trust God to save me." But after I trust God, what do you do? Go and get back all the things that you just left. So we need to work hard. We need to return to the gospel. There's one author said, the Christian need to preach the gospel to themselves every day. So are you willing to give up all up? Of course, we're not saying that you have to actually do it, but the heart is your heart condition. That's why we call this the heart of salvation. Or are you like the monkey? Hold on to the the whatever the money and don't let go, and then even you are get caught, even you'll be slaughtered, and even you will be killed. Will you still hold on to the money? Will you be able to hold on to your money in your coffin? Let's examine our heart to see whether we honor, love our God with all heart, our soul, and our might. Shall we pray together? Father, we come before you. We thank you for the sermon. We thank you for the passage. Yes, it reveals our weakness. It reveals our heart condition. But Father, we know we ask your forgiveness. We pray that we will come back to your cross, come back to your gospel, and willing to trust you and you alone. We have no good things apart from the Lord. May you richly bless us. With your Holy Spirit that open our eyes and see our condition, may we willing to honor our Lord Jesus Christ and trust Him with all our hearts. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.